One of my favorite attractions at the Disney parks is the Country Bear Jamboree. I've been wanting to do a proper video on these bears for a while, and the Walt Disney World version getting revamped into a modernized Disney-themed show was my signal. This is not meant to be a full history of the attraction, as there are quite a few of those already out there. Rather, I want to give the spotlight to each and every performer. I want to give them, and their attraction, the love and attention they deserve. In this video, I'll be covering the original shows at the American Parks and their seasonal overlays, the Christmas Special and Vacation Hoedown. I'll also be mentioning the versions playing at Tokyo Disneyland. Their main show is basically the original version dubbed in Japanese, but their Christmas and Vacation shows each have their own unique touches. The Disney World show was altered twice. In 2012, the show was trimmed down and the order of certain songs was shuffled. The more important change, of course, is the new musical Jamboree from 2024. Finally, I'll discuss the movie, walk-around characters, and general other miscellaneous material as they arise. As I did in a recent video, I'd also like to direct you to the blog Passport to Dreams Old and New. They have a great three-part series on the Country Bear Jamboree and its music, which I'll be drawing from in certain places. And now, let's talk bears. With how off-putting a number of the bears can be, it was a good move to have our host, Henry, be the first one to appear. Henry is probably the normalest looking character the audience sees, and he has a warm and welcoming personality. Voiced by Pete Renaday for all three original shows, Henry does his best to remain professional and present us with the best possible experience. Given how hectic things can sometimes get, that isn't always easy, but he generally keeps things running smoothly. According to his backstory, Henry was once a football player before getting into showbiz. He's named after Henry Haynes, one half of the country comedy duo Homer and Jethro. Their performances largely inspired Henry's interactions with Wendell, who we'll get to later. As the host, Henry plays a large role in all the shows. Not only does he welcome the audience, but he also leads the opening and closing numbers, not to mention taking part in other performances. Sometimes he'll sing along, other times he'll accompany the main singer with a guitar. While he's not as outrageous as some of the bears will be seeing, he's a vital part of the show. One gets the feeling it would all fall apart without him. Henry gets to sing most in the original show, notably leading the opening number, The Bear Band Serenade. This original song introduces the main band, The Five Bear Rugs, but it's Henry who does all the singing. He also joins them for the opening songs in the Christmas and Vacation shows, which are also written specially for the attraction. Henry leads Tracks in the Snow for Christmas, and The Bear Rugs lead The Great Outdoors for the Vacation Hoedown. Tracks in the Snow is my personal favorite, but The Great Outdoors is probably the best known song thanks to its inclusion in the Disneyland sing-along tape. Naturally, Henry remains the host in the musical Jamboree, now voiced by A.J. Lacascio. He largely plays the same role as before. As I said, Henry is the nicest looking bear, but you're not going to find him roaming around the theme park. The only time a walk-around was used was the Disney on Parade touring show. Otherwise, Henry sticks to the stage. You really couldn't do a country bear story without its host. In the 2002 movie, the bears are all given full names. Henry Dixon Taylor, voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson, is the band's manager. Although the bear band broke up years ago, they reunite to save their performance space from a ruthless land developer. Please note that Grizzly Hall, for whatever reason, is called Country Bear Hall in the movie. Henry largely acts as the jaded, grouchy old-timer who quickly warms up to the naive youngster fan. One of the bears who often falls through the cracks is Gomer, the pianist. This is because, although he loyally accompanies each and every show, he never says a word. His backstory explains that he's classically trained, but never found the appreciation he wanted playing concerts. Now he tickles the ivories in Grizzly Hall. Notably, he plays the opening instrumental piece, Pianjo, as Henry introduces the show. Similarly, in the winter show, he accompanies Henry in It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Christmas. Gomer might be the tallest of the bears, but it's hard to tell since he's always hunched over. We do have a couple indicators of a sense of humor. One comes in the vacation show. A scenery malfunction causes Henry to stand in front of a very out-of-season snowy backdrop. He frantically whispers to Gomer to play something, anything, and Gomer responds with a few bars of Jingle Bells. The other indicator is his wardrobe. The later shows give him a flashy fashion sense. In the holiday show, he wears a winter coat with Christmas lights draped around him, and the summer show has him in a Hawaiian shirt with a straw hat. Meanwhile, he was redesigned in 2012 to have a darker shade of fur and a goatee. I imagine this was to make him stand out a little more, since his initial design is admittedly kind of generic. 
I still prefer classic Gomer to the newer version. Thankfully, the musical jamboree gave Gomer a much-needed trim. The centerpiece of the show is their main band, the Five Bear Rugs. Zeke, Zeb, Ted, Fred, and Tennessee. In each show, they would perform the opening number and then a second song about halfway through. The original show had them play the Bear Band Serenade, although as I said before, it's Henry who actually does the singing, introducing each member. Later in the show, Zeke used to sing Pretty Little Devilish Mary, but this was cut in the 2012 refurbishment. The Christmas show had them open with the rousing Tracks in the Snow, and then Deck the Halls. In this show, Zeb has a cold and sneezes after each fa la 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 la. In the vacation show, they get three songs. The now classic Great Outdoors, Rocky Top, and Ghost Riders in the Sky. Zeke plays the banjo and the dishpan. He's an invaluable member of the band, since according to their backstory, he's the only one who can read music. His original voice was Dallas McKinnon, and then for some reason, he was replaced and overdubbed four years later by Randy Sparks. In the later shows, he was voiced by Harry Middlebrooks. Tennessee was originally named Lemonade. This was to rhyme with Serenade, since their introduction song is the Bear Band Serenade. In the final version of the song, the word Serenade is never actually used. His instrument of choice is the Thing, or as they say, the Thang, a one-string bass. He's been meaning to add some more strings, but it hasn't happened yet. His voice in the original show was allegedly by a member of the Stoneman family, but the exact person has not been specified. The later shows had him voiced by Lee Dresser. Ted, with his amazing lung power, blows on the jug throughout the whole show. He's so busy with his instrument that he never gets a chance to actually sing, so he doesn't have a voice actor. Fred, who plays his father's harmonica, is in the same boat. Although they blend into the background a little more as a result, I really like both their character designs. Zeb is over on the fiddle. He was originally voiced by another member of the Stoneman family. In the later shows, his singing was done by Rob Burton, and his speaking voice was Kurt Wilson. He never had much dialogue, so I'm not sure why they had two separate people do the voices. Zeb's son Oscar sits alongside the band for each show, holding his teddy bear. In the original show, he would squeak the bear periodically after some of the songs. Oscar has never had any proper lines, but you can hear him murmur a little, uh-huh, in the vacation hoedown before the band plays Ghost Riders in the Sky. This was also the only show where one of the characters actually says his name. The Bear Rugs all return in the musical jamboree and get the show's only original song, which they perform with Henry. I was happy to hear something new in the cavalcade of regurgitated Disney songs, but I wish it was a little longer. The Rugs have much less stage time than previous shows, but they all look great. Oscar's teddy bear is now a very cute stuffed Big Al. I wouldn't be surprised if this is based on a real upcoming piece of merchandise. The cynic in me thinks this is shameless marketing, but the fan in me wants one. Although the Bear Rugs feature heavily in the movie, they are never called by this title, instead just referred to as the Country Bears. We also only see four of them. Zeke apparently died beforehand, and their bus is prominently named in his honor. I imagine, practically speaking, it was easier to manage a smaller cast of bears, both story-wise and costume-wise. Fred Betterhead, voiced by Brad Garrett, seems like the most down-to-earth band member. Like in the attraction, he plays the harmonica. Although this movie took a lot of liberties with the characters, they at least acknowledge that the instrument once belonged to his father. He is happy to get the band back together, but the same cannot be said of his sibling. Brother Ted is voiced by Diedrich Bader, with singing provided by John Hyatt. He's the main reason the Bears broke up in the first place. He seemed to be the only one who took the technical parts of the job seriously, and left when he felt unappreciated. Even though he hasn't been terribly successful afterward, he still refuses to join them in their quest to save the music hall. Of course, he eventually comes around, but not before Fred punches him unconscious at one point. Tennessee O'Neill has Toby Huss as his speaking voice, and Don Henley as his singing voice. He is the overly sensitive one who's been hung up on his lost love Trixie for a long time. More on her a little later. Zeb Zuber, voiced by Stephen Root, has developed a major honey addiction. The gang finds him wallowing in a bar, deeply in debt to its owner. They make a deal that he'll play against her house band in a music showdown for his tab. With his excellent fiddle playing, Zeb is allowed to leave and hopefully gets over his honey problem. The whole fiddle contest angle makes me wonder, is Zeb the devil? Or Brian Setzer? Or Queen Latifah? Given how weird this movie is, I think all answers can be acceptable. I've more or less been going in the order the bears appear, but there are actually three characters you see before Henry takes the stage. 
I didn't necessarily want to lead with them, but this trio is still an important one. When you enter the theater, there are three mounted heads on the wall. A moose, a deer, and a buffalo. As the show begins, the heads come to life and begin complaining and heckling the performers. They really help set the mood for what's to come and end up being one of the most memorable aspects of the attraction. Melvin, the dim-witted moose, was originally voiced by Bill Lee, with Frank Welker taking over for the later shows. He was actually the subject of a video I did a few years back. For whatever reason, at some point in the 80s, Disney tried to make him a thing and had the moose appear in two separate shows. A breakfast show at Fort Wilderness, and a Christmas show starring Minnie Mouse. In Miss Minnie's Country Christmas, he was even given a full body. Check out that video for more information. Max the Deer and Buff the Buffalo are both a bit on the cranky side. Max was first voiced by Peter Renaday and later Mike West. Renaday continued to voice Henry, so I'm not sure why they didn't keep him as Max as well. Buff was voiced by Thurl Ravenscroft in all three shows. According to production notes, his original name was going to be Marvin to match with the M names of the other heads. The trio have gotten to join in a few songs over the years, but mostly they like to joke around and poke fun at the performers. They've seen countless shows, so I can understand why they've gotten restless over the years. Their biggest role is arguably in the Christmas Hoedown, which opens with Max and Melvin arguing over who gets to sing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Melvin is very eager to do the song himself, but Max argues that he should do it since he's actually a deer. During the medley at the end, they continue to butt heads over the song. They shouldn't be butting heads, since that's really all they've got. The most interesting aspect of the characters, which is no longer there, was the second set of heads guests would originally see when they exited the Disney World version. The show closed on the song Come Again, which the trio got to sing part of. As guests left the theater, they entered the mile-long bar, later the Pecos Bill Cafe, and found the other heads singing Come On In to the same tune. I remember being confused how they managed to move themselves in a few seconds, but maybe this is meant to be their identical twins. It didn't really make sense, but I still liked it. For the Vacation Hoedown, they sang another song about the bar to the tune of The Great Outdoors. There's no footage of the Christmas variation, but I remember seeing them back in 97 and hearing Max tell the story of Rudolph to the others. Hopefully that's not just a fabricated memory. If anyone remembers that specifically, please drop a comment. Disneyland's Mile Long Bar also had a set of animal heads, but these ones were only props, not animatronics. The same heads can be seen in the Winnie the Pooh attraction that replaced the Disneyland bears, creepily hidden in the Have Lumps and Woozle section. It's a fairly well-known secret among park fans, but you do have to strain yourself if you want to see them. They're directly above you when you enter the room. The mounted heads are back for the musical jamboree, and chatty as ever. In fact, this show probably gives them the most dialogue out of everyone, having them become even more active in the performances. They also get to sing Come Again once more at the end, making it the only song from the original to return. Max is voiced by Stephen French, Melvin is voiced by Roger Craig Smith, and Buff is voiced by Fred Tatashore. I think part of the reason these three are so beloved is because of how familiar the audience is allowed to get with them. The bears come and go, depending on who's performing, but the heads are visible at all times, even before and after the show. We form a strange bond with them. We're sad to leave them, but happy whenever we return to the theater and see them hanging on the wall, ready to watch yet another country bear performance. Wendell, voiced by Bill Cole, appears twice in the original show as Henry's singing partner. According to his backstory, he was also an aspiring athlete, just like Henry. This could be why they get along so well. Wendell was just too small to play basketball or football. He either got stepped on or used as the ball itself. Wendell sings Fractured Folk Song and Mama Don't Whoop Little Buford with Henry. When the show was revamped in 2012, Folk Song got cut for time. The real loss was the interaction between Henry and Wendell before the song. It was short, but it was a nice little character moment that added a great deal of charm to both bears. It's kind of surprising that Don't Whoop Little Buford lasted as long as it did, given the song's dark humor. But I'm not complaining. Whenever I saw the show, it almost always got one of the biggest laughs. A third song was considered for Wendell and Henry at one point, The Funny Farm. This is not to be confused with the novelty They're Coming to Take Me Away, but is instead another Homer and Jethro number. The later shows made Wendell something of a luckless sad sack, now voiced by Dave Durham. The Christmas special had him sing Oh What a Christmas, an original song based on the 12 Days of Christmas. In the song, Wendell describes going hunting and spending the next week or so lost in the woods during the holidays. I remember seeing that as a kid and really feeling for the poor bear. 
Luckily, before anyone can get too sad, Clumsy Wendell's gun goes off, shooting out some of the stage lights. His bad luck continues in the vacation hoedown, where he sings On the Road again. We see a slideshow of his family road trip, where his car repeatedly breaks down. The highlight is at the end, when he takes a flash photo of the audience, and is swiftly reprimanded by a cast member. In the musical Jamboree, Wendell is voiced by Chris Thiele. He is now paired with Teddy Barra to sing A Whole New World with a Moonlit Background. It's disappointing that the character was meant to be Henry's comedy partner, but only the first show ever truly took advantage of their pairing. It's doubly sad, considering that Homer and Jethro were such a big influence on the Jamboree. But now, even Wendell's underdog personality is gone, and he's just a little bear singing a love song. Wendell is one of the bears who received a walk-around variant, which has shown up over the years in various promotional footage, sing-along tapes, live shows, parades, and meet-and-greets. Up next is one of the most recognizable bears, Liverlips McGraw, originally voiced by Jimmy Stoneman. His backstory explains that Liverlips is a pretty well-known performer all around the U.S., but has a generally down-to-earth personality. The bear's simple pleasures are reflected in his song, My Woman Ain't Pretty, But She Don't Swear None. In the later shows, certain characters were tweaked or retooled. We already saw Wendell go from Henry's wisecracking buddy to a lovable loser. For whatever reason, Liverlips became an Elvis impersonator voiced by Dave Durham. He sings the original Rock and Roll Santa for Christmas, wearing a flashy red outfit that even rivals Gomer's costume. Meanwhile, he sings We Can Make It to the Top in the Summer Show. In this performance, he stresses a mountain climber, and as the curtains close, we hear his rope give way. Mr. McGrawl yodels the whole way down. The Japanese version of Vacation Hoedown is mostly the same, complete with English lyrics, but includes the Sunbonnet Trio backing him up. The musical Jamboree renames the character Romeo McGrawl, and he's voiced by Big Sandy. The Elvis costume and hairdo are mostly intact, and his lips are still a prominent focus as he sings Kiss the Girl. I'll admit, that's a pretty fine choice. Another reason Liver Lips is so well known is because he also has a walk-around character who is able to meet guests up close and in person. He's been used in quite a few live shows as well. I mentioned in my Melvin the Moose video that there was a time in the early 80s when the bear was called Liver Lips Louie in some of these shows, as opposed to Liver Lips McGrawl. I'm still not sure why. In these shows, he was voiced by Jack Wagner, who also voiced his fellow bears. And now, permit me to wax poetic for a few moments about my complicated feelings toward Liverlips. I first saw this character in the Disneyland Fun sing-along tape, along with Wendell and Shaker. I was initially quite scared of these strange bears with their janky faces. And yet, when you're a child and something scares you, you aren't just frightened, you're also fascinated. I could not take my eyes away from these grotesque characters, try as I might. The moment that affected me the most was when a group of kids goes into one of the Tom Sawyer Island caves and runs out screaming, followed by a groggy liver lips who they've accidentally woken. I decided then and there that if I ever went to that island, I was not setting foot in one of those caves. My feelings for the bears softened when I actually visited the attraction later on, but it helped knowing they weren't about to leap off the stage and into the audience. They weren't going to pull a sweetums on me. I also could not find any bears in the Tom Sawyer caves, thank goodness. As I grew more comfortable with the characters, I warmed up more to Liverlips. Then, a few years ago, it happened. I was on my honeymoon at Disney World. While walking through World Showcase, we saw a group of characters out and about. There, just a few feet away from me, was Liverlips McGrawl. A small jolt of terror shot through me, but it was quickly replaced with excitement. I was able to meet one of my childhood fears face to face, and found that we got along quite nicely. My lips aren't exactly small either, so we had some common ground. It's taken a long time, but I think Liverlips has finally become my favorite country bear. Several bears have had titles and nicknames in the Jamboree. Later on, we'll be hearing about Terence the Shaker, Ernest the Dude, and Teddy the Swinger. Our next player, Trixie, does not have an official nickname, but an early rundown dubbed her The Loser. The sight of the enormous, rotund bear wearing a much too small skirt holding a handkerchief in one paw and a martini glass in the other is quite funny. And yet, Trixie is more than a visual gag. We notice the forlorn look on her face. We hear the tender voice of Cheryl Poole sing, Tears will be the chaser for your wine. In just a moment, we become captivated by this sad little character. Well, maybe not little, but certainly delicate. Her backstory states that Trixie has traveled a lot over the years as a performer. Now that she's settled down in Florida, she's known as the Tampa Temptation. 
For the Christmas and vacation overlays, Trixie was voiced by Suzanne Sherwin. The character got a little bolder, but her song still focused on heartbreak. In the Christmas show, Trixie sings the original song Hibernating Blues, holding a pair of skates and a mistletoe. She tries her luck with a bashful Henry, who attempts to turn her down as politely as he can. In the Japanese version, Trixie is once again holding her martini. Over there, she sings an especially melancholy version of Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, rewritten as a breakup song. Unlike most of the show, she performs it in English. The Vacation Hoedown gives her another original song, Life's No Picnic Without You. Two versions were written, a demo recording that sounds heartbreakingly tender, while the final show takes a bluesier approach. In Japan, she sings Achy Breaky Heart. Interestingly, the first and third verses are performed in Japanese, with an English verse in the middle. A more confident Trixie, voiced by Emily Ann Roberts, sings Try Everything in the newest show, backed up by the Sunbonnets. Disney seemed to be the most excited to promote this part. Roberts was shown recording it during an episode of We Call It Imagineering, and then sang it live at the This Is Magic Media event. The Country Bears movie took a very different direction with the character. Trixie St. Clair is not the jilted lover this time around. In fact, she does the jilting. Tennessee, her ex, is the one left in tears when she leaves him for a panda. The two eventually reconcile and sing a romantic duet. It would appear that this Trixie is not really Trixie at all. Her character design and attitude are much closer to another character, Teddy Barra, to the point where I'm not sure why they didn't just go with her in the first place. Teddy, as we'll soon see, is one of the most memorable characters in the franchise. This version of Trixie was voiced by Candy Ford, and had singing by Bonnie Raitt. Raitt and Tennessee's singing voice, Don Henley, both make a conspicuous cameo as patrons watching the duet. This bear has a couple titles. Terence is also known as Terence the Shaker, and most commonly, just Shaker. His nickname comes from how he vibrates and shakes his hips. His backstory gives us another title, The Vibrating Wreck from Nashville Tech. It also says he aspired to be a great actor, but his career was cut short when he fell off the balcony during a production of Romeo and Juliet. I suppose he just couldn't get that shaking under control. Because I know this character so well as Shaker, not to mention it's been the name Disney has called him since 1984, I'm going to refer to him as such for the rest of the video. In the original show, Shaker was voiced by Val Stoneman and sang a short rendition of How Long Will My Baby Be Gone. This was followed by an odd little moment where he just wriggled his eyebrows for a few seconds as the curtains closed. The Disneyland and Tokyo versions put more emphasis on his gyrating hips, which were never as prominent in Disney World. The later shows gave him a passion for animal acts and a new shake your voice, courtesy of Harry Middlebrooks. For Christmas, Shaker has fully gotten into the Yuletide spirit by dyeing his fur white like a polar bear and attempts to perform Blue Christmas with a penguin. The penguin, however, is frozen in a block of ice and isn't able to sing, much to Shaker's annoyance. This was one of the jokes that never quite landed for me. I think the idea is that the penguin's been flown in from the Arctic and hasn't thought out yet? In the Japanese version, the penguin is not frozen, but oddly enough, he still doesn't sing. Instead, Shaker sings while the penguin makes little spoken asides. For the vacation hoedown, Shaker teams up with Dolores the Octopus. Decked out in his beachwear, Shaker sings the heartfelt Two Different Worlds, declaring his love for her. He is clearly reconsidering the act because he keeps frantically whispering for her to loosen her grip. Dolores, who does not have a visible mouth, only giggles in response. This version of the character can currently be seen in the queue of Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. The Japanese show gives Dolores a fully animated face and allows her to sing with Shaker. They perform the original song Over My Head Over You, which was also considered for the American version. An English demo is floating around online. Even though the performance feels a bit more heartfelt, Shaker still calls for help at the end. Even in Japan, there's only so many tentacles someone can take. There were a lot of songs about heartbreak in the previous shows, especially the original one. The only number that's vaguely along those lines in the new show, and I really do mean vaguely, is Fixer Upper. Shaker, voiced by Mac McAnally, sings a few solo lines, but most of it is performed with Henry and the Mounted Heads. A Frozen song was inevitable, but I'm a little surprised they chose this one given its divisive nature among fans. Happily, he still does a weird shaky dance afterward. Shaker is yet another bear who has frequently appeared as a walk-around character in the parks. The Sunbonnet Trio, Bubbles, Bunny, and Beulah, are three little bear girls who sing bubbly numbers in tight harmony. 
Next to Oscar, they're the youngest members of the show, and even do their schoolwork between performances. Their backstory says all the other bears help them, but they get good grades anyway. In their first show, voiced by Jackie Ward, Luli Jean Norman, and Peggy Clark, the girls memorably sing, All the guys that turn me on, turn me down. Accompanying this is a slideshow of a lady bear having bad luck with men. Given how young the sunbonnets are, it's probably for the best that all these guys are saying no. They actually had a different song considered, You Make a Left and Then a Right. It went as far as having its own slideshow art produced, but ultimately went unused. The song is all about adultery, and arguably even more inappropriate for such young characters to sing. Also on a personal note, I think the song they ended up performing is a lot catchier and more of a crowd pleaser. In later shows, the girls were voiced by Diane Michelle, Laurie Johnson, and Holiday Mason. The Christmas special had the girls sing a delightful version of Sleigh Ride, again with a humorous slideshow playing behind them. The vacation show lacked the slides for the girls, which were used earlier in Wendell's song. The Sunbonnets, all ready for the beach, performed the Beach Boys' California Girls, rewritten as California Bears. I've heard some complaints about song choices in the later shows, especially Vacation, not being country enough. I really love all the shows, but I'll agree that no matter how you orchestrate or arrange it, California Girls simply isn't country. Of course, most of the songs in the newest show are not country in the slightest. Case in point, try everything. The girls, who I mentioned sing this one with Trixie, are no longer called the Sunbonnets, since in fairness they haven't worn bonnets since their first appearance. The slideshow behind them is back, showing a number of humorous images of Trixie trying things and failing before she found her talent for singing. Out of the whole revamped show, this is one of my favorite parts. I'm not crazy about the song choice, but the illustrations feel very in spirit with the older show and have a good sense of comedic timing. In this version, the girls are voiced by Tanya Hankeroff, Rachel Robinson, and Cindy R. Walker. A photo from Disney On Parade shows that there were walk-around versions of the Sunbonnets who hung upside down on trapezes. The costumes look a bit shabby, but the performance must have been impressive. The next performer is Ernest, nicknamed The Dude, which refers to a city slicker. This is indicated by Ernest's relatively fancy outfit. His backstory is primarily about how proud he is of his wardrobe, although he never gets the recognition he feels he deserves. Ernest was originally voiced by Van Stoneman until 1975, when Randy Sparks recorded new vocals. As I mentioned, Sparks also took over for Zeke at that time, and I'm still not sure what exactly the reason was. In the original show, Ernest played the fiddle and sang, If you can't bite, don't growl, sheepishly describing an encounter with a lady while out on the town. As we've seen so far, certain bears have a through line that either lasts for all the shows or was introduced in the seasonal overlays. Trixie has always sung about heartbreak, while Liverlips became an Elvis impersonator in the overlay shows. Ernest's theme is a little harder to decipher, but I believe the overlays added the idea of being at odds with nature. Now voiced by Mike Weston, Ernest sings the original song Hungry as a Bear on the Christmas show, accompanied by the five bear rugs. Dressed in a classy Christmas sweater, Ernest is snowed in and has run out of food. In the vacation hoedown, he sings another original song, Nature, which ends with him getting attacked by a bee. The fly swatter tied to his bowstring is not as helpful as he had hoped. He has an easier time in the Japanese version, where he performs mountain music with Henry and the Rugs. Ernest is looking spiffy as ever in the musical Jamboree. He's in his costume from Barry Poppins, and plays a very fast-paced version of Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. In a gag that feels like it really could have come from the original show, the fiddle begins smoking from the intensity. Even though he doesn't get a chance to actually sing, I think Ernest has become the highlight of this show. Henry also mentions he used to play with the Mineral Kings, which was the name of the unbuilt ski resort that the Bears were first designed for. The Country Bears have been full of surprises so far, but as the show nears its conclusion, it presents its biggest visual highlight. Instead of a curtain opening on the next performer, or them rising from the floor, this bear descends from the ceiling on a flowered swing. It's the one and only Swingin' Teddy Barra. Teddy was inspired by three famous sex symbols. Her name is based on the silent movie actress Theta Barra, her swinging gimmick is borrowed from Evelyn Nesbitt, and her appearance is based on Mae West. She also gets West's famous line when she tells the audience to come up and see her sometime. Henry, who is quite infatuated with the swinger, has probably taken her up on that offer once or twice. Unlike many of the other bears, there's no attempts at getting a laugh here. Miss Barra is pure spectacle, and comes as quite the pleasant surprise if you've never seen the show. I mentioned that Trixie's heartbroken song elicits pity in spite of her comical presentation, but Teddy accomplishes this even better. 
Her soft rendition of Heart, We Did All That We Could is absolutely beautiful. Her voice actress, Patsy Stoneman, completely sells it. There's a demo out there of an original song called Cuddle Some Bubble Some Bear that may have been written for either Trixie or Teddy. It's nice, but I think both girls had much more effective ballads than the actual show. The later shows kept Teddy as one of the relatively serious acts. Now voiced by Genia Fuller Cruz, she sings the Christmas song in the holiday show while nursing a broken leg from a skiing accident. It's a soft, tender moment between her and Henry, who accompanies her on the guitar. The vacation show is a little more whimsical. It begins to rain, and Teddy descends in a poncho performing Singing in the Rain. Like California Girls, it doesn't really translate to country very well, but it's at least pleasant. The most recent version of Teddy is voiced by Alison Russell and sings A Whole New World with Wendell. The most interesting part of this performance is actually in the press release. It mentions that Henry is jealous of the pairing. Wendell is his best friend, and he clearly has feelings for Teddy. I was curious to see how this would play out in the show, eager to see some new character interactions. Unfortunately, it's as straightforward as you can get. They come out, they sing, they leave. Oh well. Outside the theater, Teddy lent her name to Teddy Barra's Swingin' Arcade in Disneyland. There's not much documentation on this attraction, but it apparently had a Country Bear-themed pinball machine. There's also a game called Hoof and Henry, where you pressed buttons to control a little dancing Henry marionette. Other versions of this game still exist in and outside of Disneyland. A walk-around version of Teddy Barra existed at one point, but I'm not sure if she ever visited the theme parks. The only photos I found of her were from an old ice skating show. Given how popular the character is, coupled with her looking a bit more presentable than her co-stars, I think it would be nice to see Teddy actually meet guests someday. Teddy Barra is a well-loved character, but there's one performer that has even her beat. It's everyone's favorite country bear, Big Al. Once again, to gain a deeper understanding of the character, we must turn to his official backstory. He has been singing ever since he was a little cub. Although some say he never got any better, Al has music in his old bones and will continue to play, despite being on his 10th farewell tour. Let me walk you through the Big Al experience. We hear an off-chord guitar string. The curtains part to reveal a large old bear strumming his guitar with a vacant but happy look on his face. He passionately draws out a bit of blood on the saddle. The song is about a terrible rodeo accident, but since we only hear one verse out of context, it sounds nonsensical. It's bewildering, off-putting, and hilarious. They say in theater you should always leave your audience wanting more. Al does not seem to be aware of this, because as Henry and his buddy Sammy begin the finale, Al's curtains open back up so he can do an encore of his song. He believes the audience loves him, and most of the time he's right. Henry has to call all the other bears to drown Al singing out, but no matter how spirited their performance gets, Al cannot be stopped. Finally, Al tips over backwards and crashes as the curtains close. Sometimes a little gravity does the trick. During the planning stages, Big Al was called Big Herbert, but was later named after animator and Imagineer Albertino. In fact, he was modeled after Mr. Bertino as well. His voice was taken directly from a previous recording by Tex Ritter. His laugh at the end of the song was by Thurl Ravenscroft, most likely to make the part where the recording cuts off seem less abrupt. In later shows, Al was voiced by Peter M. Climes. The holiday show found a hungover Al dressed as Baby New Year. He had an original song called Another New Year, set to the tune of Away in a Manger, about how his lover has left him. The Tokyo version was a little less depressing, and just had Al singing All Lang Syne. The vacation hoedown continued the trend of Al having his own heartbreak numbers, making him a sillier male equivalent to Trixie. He sings the original I Got Lost on My Way to Your Heart, while literally being lost in the wilderness. Once again, Tokyo gives him an easier time and just has him sing I've Been Working on the Railroad. In the musical jamboree, Al starts to sing Remember Me, but has to stop when he gets overcome with emotion. He tries to come back after the finale to sing again, but the curtains close before he can overstay his welcome. I was hoping against hope that they would keep the vintage recording of Blood on the Saddle, the song that we know and love the character for. It would also fit with Al's stubborn personality. I can picture him thinking, he's been singing this song for years, the audience likes it, why change? Who knows, maybe I'm the stubborn one. Big Al's popularity has led to him having the most exposure outside the attraction. A small shop is named after him for one thing. A children's book entitled Big Albert Moves In was released to promote the show. In this version of the story, Al, or rather Albert, 
is portrayed as a careless bear who can't find a good hibernation cave in time. After some antics in a local town, he ends up inadvertently journeying to sunny Florida, where he finds a job with the country bears. Another piece of promotional printing came in the form of a comic from around the same time. Big Al, still called Big Albert, plays a slightly antagonistic role here, where he, along with Teddy Barra and Ernest, shirk their duties and run off on a picnic. Henry, Sammy, Mickey, and Donald chase the wayward bears all over Frontierland to get them back to the theater on time. Unsurprisingly, Big Al has a walk-around costume. There was a period in the 80s where he wasn't used as often as Shaker, Wendell, and Liverlips, but he's easier to come by now. He was the second bear we encountered on Honeymoon, standing above Grizzly Hall. It was a pleasant surprise. We met two country bears on our trip, which is two more than I thought we'd meet. There's some vintage footage of Al performing with his bear brethren in Disney on Parade. It's the same joke as the original Jamboree, where Al keeps singing over the other's finale song. What's interesting is that instead of the classic Blood on the Saddle, he's singing Down in the Valley. It could have been a copyright issue with a Tex Ritter recording. Most recently, a statue of Big Al has been erected in the Grizzly Peak section of California Adventure. This is a pleasant surprise, since the bears were previously evicted from Disneyland in favor of Winnie the Pooh. It's nice to see them come back to Anaheim in some fashion. I don't know why they didn't just move the whole show to Grizzly Peak back in the 2000s. California Adventure needed all the help it could get. It would be shameful if the movie did not include Big Al, but thankfully they did. Voiced by James Gammon, Al is the theater's groundskeeper, who has a strange but sweet obsession with the grass. He is very adamant that no one step on it. He is also surprisingly fast, but only when no one's looking. This version is still on the spacey side, but he has a good heart. Although he has relatively smaller screen time than the other bears, he still winds up being the most lovable character, as you would expect. With all this said, the question remains, just why does everyone love Big Al so much? Well, first and foremost, he's funny. He ends the show on a high note, even if that note is off-key. He's also self-assured in an endearingly oblivious sort of way. We love him because he so clearly enjoys what he does. I'm reminded of a quote attributed to Florence Foster Jenkins. She is regarded as a performer of legend for all the wrong reasons. Despite people calling her the world's worst opera singer, Jenkins once said, People may say that I can't sing, but no one can ever say I didn't sing. As the show draws to a close, Henry appears once more wearing a coonskin cap on his top hat. Putting a hat on a hat is generally frowned upon in writing, but this is a special hat. It still has the raccoon attached. When Lil Sammy pokes his head out, it almost always got a positive reaction from the audience. It's hard not to fall in love with him on the spot, and his high-pitched voice from Bill Cole is adorable. He and Henry start to sing the show's only pre-existing Disney song, The Ballad of Davy Crockett. It should be noted that on the line where Davy killed him a bear when he was only three, they change it to Tamed Him a Bear, or Tamed Him a Bar if you're going to do the Southern Drawl. This is when Big Al interrupts. Henry and Sammy call out the rest of the cast to drown him out with a loud round of Old Slewfoot. Sammy is back again for the finale of The Christmas Show, now voiced by Frank Welker. He and Henry begin a winter medley with Let It Snow and are joined by the Sunbonnets. I mentioned the Mounted Heads getting in another Rudolph argument, followed by the entire cast coming out to sing Winter Wonderland. Wendell accidentally shoots out one of the stage lights again, which only dampens the mood a tiny bit. True to character, Big Al continues singing as the curtains close, either oblivious to the fact the song is over, or just desperate for a few more seconds in the limelight. Sammy did not appear in the vacation hoedown, with a different little critter taking his place. At a couple points during the show, one of the bears sees a skunk, leading to mass panic. At the end, the skunk winds up atop Henry's head, in the exact same position as Sammy. It turns out he never met any trouble, he just wanted to get into show business. The skunk is named Randy, although it's never said during the show, and he's also voiced by Frank Walker. Henry reluctantly lets him join in, since when you have a skunk perched atop your head, it's best to humor him. Everyone comes out to sing, Thank God I'm a Country Boy, or rather, Thank God I'm a Country Bear, with Randy adding, And Skunk, at the end of each verse. In the Japanese version, they sing a medley of Camp Town Races, She'll Be Coming Round the Mountain, and an original song, Vacation. The musical jamboree ditches the hat angle and just sits him next to Henry with a little cowboy hat of his own, now voiced by Isaac Robinson Smith. As the show nears its close, they share a duet of You've Got a Friend in Me, followed by the whole cast performing The Bare Necessities. I really wish they could have kept him as a coonskin cap, since it's such a great joke. Without it, 
Henry just has a raccoon for some reason. Sammy was also featured as Henry's hat in Disney on Parade. He's a memorable character, even if he doesn't totally make sense. Different portrayals seem to vary how much of him is a hat and how much is an actual raccoon. No matter how you divide his body, he's 100% cute and almost manages to steal the show away from Big Al. That takes care of everyone who appeared on stage, but we still have a couple more characters to cover. When Bear Country first opened in Disneyland, there was a cave at the entrance that belonged to a bear named Rufus. No one ever saw him, but his snores could be heard echoing inside. When Splash Mountain was built and the land became Critter Country, Rufus was briefly relocated to Chickapin Hill. At the beginning of the ride, guests would float by his cave with the sleepy bear still snoring. Very quickly, the name on the mailbox was changed from Rufus to Br'er Bear. The snores were still heard, but they belonged to a different bear now. I suppose that made a bit more sense and helped tie the attraction's story together. Luckily, Rufus was far from forgotten. He became a stagehand in the overlay shows and the newest musical jamboree. Whenever something goes wrong, Henry calls to Rufus for help. Once again, Rufus is heard but not seen. Annoyed grunts and grumbles come from behind the audience as Rufus lumbers around, trying to fix the lights or start the projector. He usually sounds a little cranky, so hopefully he's still able to get in some good naps between shows. There's also Ursus H. Bear, the founder of Grizzly Hall. He's depicted in portrait form above center stage. I don't remember if this was established only for the musical jamboree, but he's apparently Henry's grandfather. That certainly explains the resemblance. He also had a shop named after him in Bear Country. Ursus H. Bear's Wilderness Outpost. Most recently, it's been announced that Critter Country's Hungry Bear Restaurant will be redone as the Country Bear Barbecue Jamboree. Ursus is featured in the logo, wearing a chef's hat. It's nice to see the bears will return to Disneyland's Critter Country in some form. There's one final bear for this video, and it also gives me a chance to talk about the movie a little more. The Country Bears came out at a very strange time. In 2001, the Country Bears show in California closed. In 2002, the movie came out. Although Florida and Tokyo still had their bears, it was odd that a theatrical film was released right after we lost one of the attractions. It feels like there's a lack of communication between the movie and theme park divisions. A good deal of our beloved bears are missing. Aside from the ones I discussed earlier, Henry mentions Gomer and Liverlips briefly. Much as I love Mr. Lips, it might have been for the best that we didn't see the Creature Shop's take on his design. The movie does introduce one new bear character, Barry Barrington, voiced by Haley Joel Osment, with singing by E.G. Daly. The tone of the movie is set pretty quickly when we see Barry asking his human family if he's adopted. The cub sets out on the road to find out where he truly belongs, and joins up with Henry to save the theater. Although Barry is meant to be the emotional heart of the movie, he tends to fade into the background when he's not actively driving the plot. He's essentially the anchor to keep the movie from devolving into total insanity. I don't know if he exactly succeeded where that was concerned, but I understand why they felt like they needed a character like him. I was already in love with the bears at this point. Although I was initially excited at a Country Bear movie, once I realized how little they resembled the theme park versions, not to mention seeing that car wash gag in every single commercial break for several months, I lost interest. I finally saw the movie many years later and didn't think too much of it. I watched it again for this video, and the weirdest thing happened. I enjoyed myself. I ended up feeling the same way I had about 102 Dalmatians. I can't really call it objectively good, but I was thoroughly entertained. This was like Spice World, but with a coherent plot. And bears. Maybe it's because it seems like a lot of things lately have become somewhat bland and homogenized, at least from my point of view. There's an unrestrained, nightmarish madness to movies like The Country Bears that we need more of in the mainstream. The jokes range from surprisingly good, to bad, to seemingly written on another planet, and although the bears don't look like the ones from the show, it's still some impressive work from the creature shop. I wish it had adhered more to the source material, but that might have prevented it from being as bonkers as it ended up. We are looking at a unique beast here. If you approach this one with an open mind and have some honey on tap, you might end up with a guilty pleasure. I made this video because I adore the Country Bear Jamboree. This attraction really seems to be a love it or hate it show. I've seen people swear by it, and I've seen people completely dismiss it. I'm not against the idea of giving an update, but I wish it had been handled somewhat differently. At the beginning of the original show, Henry introduces it as featuring a bit of Americana, our musical heritage of the past. That idea is completely gone now. It's just Disney songs. 
Disney songs arranged in a fun country style, but still Disney songs. And look, when you're at the Disney parks, you already hear a lot of Disney songs. You're surrounded by them. That makes sense, but the Country Bear Jamboree used to be a great mix of original and authentic. Same with the seasonal overlays. Now it feels like... Well, I think this old meme actually sums up quite nicely. Yo dog, I heard you like Disney, so I put some Disney in your Disney so you can Disney while you Disney. <laughs> that takes me back. One of the most special things about the bears was that they were created first and foremost for the Disney parks. They were 100% original, which is getting increasingly rare these days. Now that they're singing Disney songs, it feels like they've been absorbed by the machine and homogenized. Not only that, but they chose the bog standard Disney songs. The ones everyone knows from movies everyone likes. Would I be praising the revamp if they chose weird deep cuts like the title song from the Shaggy DA? Probably not, but it would have been interesting. The show seems to have lost a little of its soul. The songs are mostly chipper and upbeat. We need a moment of sadness, of contemplation. Heart We Did All That We Could is beautiful, and even the sillier How Long Is Forever is more than a little wistful. Just like Splash Mountain has been stripped of its dramatic buildup and release, the Bears have lost that aching sometimes behind country music. On a larger scale, it also feels like Frontierland is losing its western spirit. Splash Mountain has become a slice of New Orleans, the shooting gallery is closed, and there are mysterious plans for Big Thunder Mountain and beyond. Even within the country Bears, Henry has lost his Davy Crockett cap, or at least Sammy no longer functions as one, and the old-timey music hall aesthetic has given way to modernized costumes and songs. You could argue that the seasonal shows did the same thing, especially the Vacation Hoedown, but they were never meant to be permanent. The original Jamboree truly was a slice of Americana. Frontierland was always a fantasy, but within that context, it felt like a real, old-fashioned western town that just happened to have a theater run by talking bears. Despite my complaining, I know it could be worse. For years, there were rumors of the show being replaced by Woody's Roundup. There's also some concept art of an earlier Disney-themed bear revamp, which had, among other things, Henry wearing a band leader's hat with Mickey Mouse ears, and Max wearing an Olaf cap. At least they managed to restrain themselves. Plus, some of the new arrangements are quite nice, like Kiss the Girl. At this moment, it's hard to say how history will view the newest version of the Country Bears. Will it become a new classic, or will it be regarded as a slightly better tiki room under new management? The audiences love it in the preview videos, but some of it is that they're just excited to be witnessing a new show. At the same time, I think the novelty will wear off soon. It's fun to hear what Disney songs were chosen, as evidenced by the audience's joyous reactions to hearing Wendell and Teddy sing A Whole New World, but once that's said and done, how will it hold up in the long run? I suppose I'll have to shrug my shoulders and concede that these new bears are better than no bears. The characters are still lovable, the animatronics are fully functioning, and there's always a chance of the original show coming back someday, or perhaps another new version that has better song variety. To be clear, I'm not opposed to the Bears singing Disney songs, I just wish they had balanced them more between original and classic country songs. Sorry to end that video on kind of a downer note. I know the idea of country singing Bears is goofy, but it's that endearing goofiness that makes us love them. Even if the idea is silly, it was still taken seriously by the Imagineers, with a lot of heart, and of course, a lot of fun. Grousing aside, the Bears are still performing today, which wasn't always a given. And for that, I am thankful. As you know, my favorite bear is Liverlips, and my wife really likes Ernest. Something about those expressive eyebrows. Let me know in the comments who your favorite bear is, and thank you, as always, for your support.